Thank you, guys. Let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. St. John Paul the Great, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, first, I just want to sincerely thank you for coming to this workshop. Um, if you're like me, you've got friends in the trans community. Uh, if you're like me, you've actually got family members who identify as trans. Um, you love these people, you care deeply about them, and sometimes you feel probably a bit mystified. I'm like, how do we approach this subject with compassion? Like, how do I actually support this person uh, without compromising what the church teaches? Should I be using their preferred pronoun? Should I not do that? We feel lost at times. You know, in fact, some of you may experience gender dysphoria yourself and wonder what, what is God's plan for me and, and my life? And I think we should start right there. And honestly, 30 minutes, you know as well as I do, is not enough time for this subject. It deserves hours, it deserves weeks. But if we're gonna talk about if you experience it, one verse in the Bible, what God thinks about it, that says better than anything. Lord, for you love all things that exist, and you loathe none of the things which you have made, for would you would not have made anything if you had hated it. In other words, these individuals who wrestle with this, that, that God loves you, that he's a plan for you, not only does they deserve our love, they deserve compassion, but they also deserve the truth. And honestly, I think as a church, We've done a decent job of talking about transgender ideology, but honestly, I think sometimes we forget about the individual. Perfect example, there's a university, I'm not gonna mention your name because you might be here, uh, where they announced recently on this transgender inclusion guide that although Facebook has 58 genders, and Facebook in the UK has 71, and Tumblr has a list of 500, this university said there's an actual an infinite number of genders. And so this individual wrote to the university and said, I'm wondering if I can get a, a copy of that list you have of the infinite number of genders. And so the university sent him a list of 24. And he said, well, surely if it's infinite, you can do better than 24, come on, at least 500. And they said, well, we can't list them all because some are unknown. And he said, well, how can you count them if they're unknown? He said, might I suggest the reason you cannot count them is because it would take you forever to write the list. And even if you were to have a list, the entire universe could not contain it even if the font you used was really tiny. And that was the end of their conversation. Did he win the argument? Well, I mean, I guess. But like, what good really came out of that exchange? On one side, you had an individual at this gender community, whatever, who actually knew people wrestling with this, who cared about them, but probably didn't spend a lot of time thinking through some of the logical inconsistencies. On the other side, you have a guy who probably doesn't know many people firsthand, who wrestled with gender dysphoria, but he spends a lot of time thinking about the logical inconsistencies. But here's my proposal. What if charity and clarity could meet? What if love and truth could just have a beer together and sit down? What would it actually look like for these things to come together? What would that look like? This is the proposal I have. And to, to begin to go down this path, I think we first need a little bit of understanding. Where does this all come from? I mean, hasn't it seemed like in the last five years, there's been this hockey stick of acceleration on this? Like, where did this come from? I think there's a lot of roots to this, but I think we need to avoid two extremes that I've seen in culture. In the last century or so, there's been a relentless assault on masculinity and femininity from two extreme positions. One extreme position is that gender, it's just a social construct. Masculinity, femininity, those aren't real things. Boys are into this because that's the way we raise them, and girls are into that because that's the way the culture raises them. It's just cultural conditioning. This is big in the 1970s, a sociologist decided she would prove that gender is a social construct. She said, I'll prove it with my own kid. I'm gonna raise my daughter gender neutral. And so I'm gonna give her guns and trucks and I'll give her blankets and dolls. I'll just raise her gender neutral. Well, she gave up. She said it became very frustrating because she said every single night, my daughter insists upon tucking each of her trucks into bed one at a time. Good night, little trucky. Good night. Like she couldn't scrub the maternal out of this kid. Even better, Hasbro, the toy company, recently wanted to come out with a gender neutral playhouse. Okay, now this is supposed to be a dollhouse that boys and girls would interact with in the same way. <laughs> that didn't go well. Here's they found out. They said it soon emerged that girls and boys did not interact with the structure in the same way. 
The girls dressed the dolls, kissed them, and played house. The boys catapulted the toy baby carriage from the roof. Yeah. Uh, Hasbro manager came up with a novel explanation. Boys and girls are different. Well, you think so. Um, Pope Francis chimed in on this, and he said, I ask myself if the so-called gender theory is not at the same time an expression of frustration and resignation. It seeks to cancel out sexual difference because it no longer knows how to deal with it. Yes, we risk taking a step backwards. The removal of difference, in fact, creates a problem, not a solution. And so on one end of extremes, gender is a social construct. On the other end of the stream are these overly rigid gender stereotypes that if you're a real man, you're into this. And if you're a real woman, you gotta fit into that box. But what if you don't fit into the box? Because in America, like if you're a real man, you gotta be into drinking beer and shooting deer and watching NASCAR. Okay, what if I'm not, like me, I'm not. Like I'm not into NASCAR. I couldn't stand watching cars, go in this circle for hours on it. I'd go mad, like I'm not a car guy. Like I can't even change the oil in my own car. Like that's not my thing. Am I into drinking beer? Honestly, no. I mean, sorry, pints with Aquinas. Like I'm not into that. Like. Uh, I, <laughs> I'd like perhaps a glass of red wine, a Merlot, maybe a red blend, you know, I'm more into that. Uh, am I into shooting deer? Like, no, like I actually threw a rock at a bird when I was a kid and I hit it and I still feel bad about that, okay? Like, <laughs> like I, I'm not some stereotypical man. Dude, I'm not like a six foot five football player. I'm a five foot six chastity speaker, okay? Like, I don't, I don't fit the mold, you know, but that's okay, because guess what? I don't have to fit the mold. Because I know I'm a man, not because I feel so manly, I know I'm a man because I have the body of a man. That our bodies are not meaningless, our bodies are meaningful. Again, Pope Francis chimed in on this. He said of these stereotypes, such rigidity in turn can hinder the development of an individual's abilities to the point of leading him or her to think, for example, that it's not really masculine to cultivate art or dance, it's not very feminine to exercise leadership, but I'll tell you, the most masculine man I have ever met in my life is a man who passionately loved the theater and poetry and art. And I got to see him 24 times in my life, and his name was St. John Paul II. And I've never been in the presence of a more masculine man. And thanks be to God, he didn't grow up in a culture that told him, if you're in a theater, you might not actually be a man. This is not the culture he was raised in. But these overly rigid gender stereotypes often cause questioning. But the solution is not to change one's sexual identity or to eliminate sexual distinctions, but maybe to avoid over accentuations of it. I was reading a feminist author and she said this, a woman, and she was not Christian, she said a woman is someone with a female body and any personality, not a female personality and any body. And so what I've noticed is gender stereotypes try to get a person to conform their personality to match their body. Your body's male, your personality needs to fit that. Gender theory commits the opposite mistake. It tries to get a person to conform their body to fit their personality. But what if neither one really needs to be changed? And the challenge comes, it's like, oh, okay, but what if I feel like my identity doesn't align with the biology of my body? What, what happens when these things don't seem to line up? What we have there is something called gender dysphoria. Now to understand gender dysphoria, Easiest way to understand it is think of the opposite, euphoria. Euphoria is a blissful, contentment, peaceful state. Dysphoria would be the opposite of that. This deep discontent, a feeling of a, a discongruency between my body and my identity. And it, it can be a very difficult thing, obviously. To understand that, think of it this way. How much would I need to pay you to dress as the opposite sex for the rest of your life? Would you do that for 100 bucks? No, $1,000. No, okay, well, $100,000, mm -mm, no, no, no. Now the question, why? Why would you not do that? Uh, I don't know, it just, it just wouldn't feel like me, it would just be disingenuous. But think of what it would actually feel like just for one day to dress as the opposite sex. Really take that in, to go to church, to go to the gym, to go to, at the, you would feel what? Just awkward, disingenuous, this isn't me. At least you could look forward to the end of the day when you could just disrobe and just feel at home in your normal clothing. But what if the dysphoria wasn't the outfit? What if the dysphoria was the body itself? It became this endless source of disappointment and discomfort when you look at your body. This is gender dysphoria. Now, 80 plus percent of the time, 
when a child experiences this, they will naturally come to identify with their biological sex if gender affirmative care does not intervene. And what that looks like is beginning with social transitioning. The idea is, look, if you don't feel like your body lines up with your identity, your mind is not the problem. Your body is the problem. Your body doesn't re reveal reality. Your feelings reveal reality. And so to be true to yourself, we've got a four-step plan. The first one would be social transitioning. You could change your name, your preferred pronoun, the restroom you use, and so on. Social transitioning. The second stage would be puberty blockers. Now, these are now being given to children as young as nine years old. Um, one of the drugs given is Lupron. This is a drug given to chemically castrate male sex offenders. Now, when you don't go through puberty at the natural time, that's actually a disease. It's called Kalman's syndrome. It's treated with medicine because you should be going through puberty, and the absence of puberty itself is a disease. But they tell the kids, this will, this will give you like a pause button on puberty so you can have more time to decide if transitioning is right for you. This is not a pause button. This is a fast forward button. It creates a cascade of clinical interventions that does not stop with puberty blockers. Because virtually almost 100% of the time, when a child goes on puberty blockers, they will go on to cross sex hormones. But when you put a kid from puberty blockers to cross sex hormones, it sterilizes the child for the rest of their life. And so the, the hormones are being given to the kid, whether it's a testosterone blocker, whether it's testosterone of the girls, estrogen supplements. What happens is it enhances the secondary sex characteristics. You do not develop the primary sex characteristics of the genitals, but the secondary ones you do. It creates in the woman a redistribution of fat, same with the man. Increased musculature as she's taking the testosterone. The voice deepens, and these exterior changes begin to take place. But if you wanna keep up this appearance, what it requires is a lifelong medicalization on these drugs. After five years of being on testosterone, the woman's uterus will atrophy to such a point where she's gonna to need to get a hysterectomy. The level of androgens being secreted in her body from the testosterone is the same as if she had an androgen secreting tumor in her body. But the promise is if you, if you take these things, you'll gradually feel it more at home in your own body, and then if you want, you could go on to get surgery. And so what's going on now is they're telling the girls, well, if you feel that you know, you're not truly a girl, well, top surgery might be right for you. Here's the problem. In Oakland, California, hospitals are now are performing top surgeries on children starting at 12 years old. Hospital in Los Angeles is doing for girls 13 years old. If you live in Portland, Oregon, okay, get this. At the age of 20, and you wanna get a little tattoo of a flower on your ankle as a girl, you can't get that, you're only 20 years old. You can't get a tattoo in Portland unless you're 21. You wanna use a tanning salon? You can't do that, you're 17. You have to be 18 to get a tanning salon unless you have a doctor's permission slip. Oh, but if you wanna have a radical double mastectomy, you can now receive that at the age of 15 years old without parental consent throughout the entire state of Oregon. And, and the girls, I mean, these are expensive procedures. They cost about $10,000. Where's a girl gonna come up with that money? GoFundMe.com now has 20, or no, 41,000 girls who are raising money on GoFundMe.com to have mastectomies. And people are not dropping 10 bucks, 20 bucks. Donors, benefactors are giving, here's $5,000. Go be your authentic self. And so the girls are going through these surgeries and the promise is this will give you relief. You'll finally feel at home in your own body. But it often creates an endless set of false summits. Now my breasts are gone, but my hips feel too big. Maybe I need to get that fixed and this fixed. And the idea is, well, if you just, you won't be suicidal. You'll feel at home. The challenge is within 10 years of these gender affirmative surgeries, the suicide rate climbs to 19 times higher than the general population. If you isolate only the female to male transitioners, their suicide rate is 40 times higher than the general population about a decade after the operation. And people will say that's because culture is so transphobic. It's not welcoming these individuals. In reality, those statistics are from an extremely progressive society in Sweden. The issue is not bigotry. The issue is the fact that when a person takes their own life, 90% of the time, they have a diagnosable psych psychiatric condition. And surgery and hormones are not meant to treat those things. In fact, I'm friends with an anesthesiologist, and he told me at his hospital, he's told the doctors, 
don't even approach me if you want me to give anesthesia to a patient having one of these operations. He said, I've seen the medical charts, the fact that more than 40% of these girls are on the autistic spectrum. I've seen the sexual abuse, the trauma, the broken families, and he said, this is not treating a mental illness. This is, this is collaborating with a mental illness. And so what are we to do? Well, the world tells you, look, if you've got a friend who identifies as non-binary or trans, then you should affirm them. And if you don't affirm them, then you're rejecting them. So are you gonna be a transphobic bigot or are you gonna be open-minded and loving? If those are only two options, it's like, well, I, I guess I'll do this. I mean, you be you, I guess. But what if these aren't the only two options, affirm or abandon? What if there's another option, which is accompaniment? Walking with these people, because they look, they deserve love, they deserve compassion, but they also deserve the truth. Because when you love somebody, you cannot lie to that person. Biology is not bigotry. This is why medicine is sex specific. Not just that girls can get cervical cancer and guys get prostate cancer, no. Women exhibit symptoms of a heart attack completely different than men do. Men are more prone to infectious disease, women more prone to autoimmune disease. Uh, men take longer to recover their speech after suffering a stroke than a woman because she uses both hemispheres of her brain for communication. This is why if you hit a guy on the left side of his head hard enough, he could go completely mute. You hit a woman on the left side of the head, she'll just keep right on talking. And so, um, <laughs> So we respond to drugs differently. I was reading one uh, doctor and, and his patient kept having these epileptic seizures. So he'd put her on medication, she'd have another seizure, another medication, more seizures. And he couldn't figure out why this was happening. He spoke to another doctor who's a specialist of gender medicine, not in the sense of transgender, but in our biological differences as men and women. Doctor looked at her and said, oh, well, psh, here's your problem. Look when she's having your seizures. She's having the seizures during the second phase of her menstrual cycle. During the second phase of a woman's menstrual cycle, her body experiences a surge of progesterone. Now, progesterone is a natural inhibitor of anti-epileptic medicine. So as the progesterone goes up, the efficacy of the, the anti-epileptic medicine goes down. So during the second week of the cycle, just increase the dosage, it'll offset the, the progesterone, and you should see that the seizures go away. Sure enough, he did it, it worked because biology is not bigotry. In fact, they've found more than 6,500 sex-specific genes, meaning your arteries are male or female, your esophagus is male or female, your spleen is male or female. Every cell in the human body that has a nucleus is sexed. And to all of this, a person might say, look, fine and good. I'm not saying biologically I'm male. What I'm trying to do is not change my sex, I'm trying to change my body in such a way that aligns with my sense of gender identity. What is our answer here? Well, a lot of times we want that perfect reply, that silver bullet that's gonna disprove transgenderism. No, 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 we need to cut that out. What we need to do is actually start to listen to them with reverent curiosity. Tell me more about this. When did you start feeling this? Thank you for sharing this with me. I'm sure it might've been kind of scary to tell that to me. Tell me more and, and listen. A boy came up to me in Dallas after my high school chastity talk. I'm trans and I said, oh, let's talk. And we talked for a long time and tell me about your family. And he said, well, you know, I got two older brothers or two older sisters, two younger sisters. And he's like, man, they can do nothing wrong. Like they are doted upon, they are loved, they're fond over and me. Phew, I get straight A's, I'm on the swim team, I, I got mixed martial arts going on, and nothing I do is ever good enough for my dad. Nothing is good enough for my mom. I'm always the black sheep of the family. And I said, do you think that if you were born a girl, you would have been loved as your sisters were loved? And he said, I know I would have been. And I said, and here we are. You're not longing to be a woman, you're longing to be created because you're created for love. What you're aching for is love. And you think that this is the ticket to love. Now, everybody's story is unique. And that's why it's our job not to take a cookie cutter approach with everybody. I was down at a junior high, also in Dallas, and at the seventh grade girls came up after the talk. Now there's only 30 girls in the junior high. Seven of these girls come up to me and they announced to me that they're lesbian. Okay, now they're 12 years old. I started talking to these girls. Dude, they were not erotically attracted to the eighth grade guys. They just, the, the eighth grade girls, okay? They were not erotically attracted to eighth grade girls. They just thought the eighth grade boys were disgusting, which of course we know they are. And so um, I didn't shame the girls. I said, you know what? I am really glad that you are not attracted to those guys. I said, in fact, I would be a lot more worried about you if you were attracted to those little hormonal punks. Uh, you know, and, 
and, and what I was trying to do is not shame these girls into heterosexuality. I was trying to affirm the deeper ache they had was to avoid being used. And that's why we have to listen. In one sense, to hold the person's hand. In the other sense, hold on to reality and don't let go of, any one of the, either one of those things. To walk with them in love. And if you take this posture, you might get a little bit of resentment because you don't buy off on the whole gender theory thing. But I promise you, if you don't speak the truth in love, they will resent you a lot more 10 years from now. When they come back and say, how come you never challenge these beliefs to me in a loving way? Because I'm telling you right now, a tsunami is about to hit the shore. If you've seen tsunami footage, the first thing to go is the tide goes out to sea. And if you don't know what that means, you'll just walk out. Oh, look at this. There's a shipwreck. There's a coral reef. Oh, this is really neat. If you know what's about to hit shore, you head for the hills. This is a sign a tsunami is coming and you run for the shore. Right now, our culture is out to sea with this whole thing. Oh yeah, trans this, trans that. But I'm telling you, the waves are about to hit. Go to reddit.com. One of the Reddit subreddits now is D-trans. How many people identify as D-trans on Reddit? 43,000 of them. And they are screaming from the rooftops. I did this, I had the surgery, I tried it. It wasn't the answer to the problem, it just created more problems. They're starting websites, blogs, lawsuits. A woman named Kiera Bell sued a gender clinic over the whole transition process she went through as a minor over in the United Kingdom. It went up to the high court in England, their Supreme Court, and the judges ruled in her favor. Now, they're an appeals court, trying to overturn this thing, but now the biggest gender clinic in all of the United Kingdom has been ordered to be shut down. And the only thing that's changing it is these detransitioners, and they're speaking up, and they're brave. And what, what they're trying to say is, yes, these people deserve love. Yes, these people deserve compassion, but there's not only one pathway of intervention, of help, of transitioning. That's not the only answer. And so this is the point where I think theology can step in, not with condemnation, but with clarity. Because Vatican II said that when God is forgotten, the creature itself grows unintelligible. Meaning if we as a culture lose sight of supernatural realities, it will actually come to the point where we can't even see natural realities. And so the church's answer to this disintegration of the human person is an integrated vision of man. How do we know our identity? Like, can we actually trust the body? Is it meaningless or is it meaningful? Like, are there really 58 different genders and peoples and LGBTQIA+, like, is that the way we should look at ourselves? The church says no. There are not 58 different types of persons, there's three. A person is a rational being. There's only three rational beings, types. You have divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You have angelic persons, angels and demons, and you have human persons made male and female in the image and likeness of God. And so if you're a human person who experiences transgender inclinations, your identity is you are a beloved child of God. And what God has created in you, in your body, John Paul II and his theology of the body points out, the human body is the only creation of God that makes a person visible, right? Animals have bodies, but they're not a personal being. Angels are personal beings, but they don't have a body. So the human body alone in creation makes a person visible. And this is easy enough to prove. Like if, if you say, hey, I'm going to the concert tonight, are you going? Well, look, if you're going to the concert, I'm willing to bet your body is going to the concert as well. It's, um, it's a very high probability it will accompany you because you don't have a body like you have a pair of jeans. Your body is you. But here's the problem. If we untether our, who we are, our identity from our body, our identity needs to attach to something. And what it'll attach to is the personality. But the challenge is there are as many personalities as there are persons, and you'll end up with an endless spectrum of gender if that is our identity attached to the personality. And so what John Paul points out to us is that we've been given a task to rediscover the very meaning of our bodies, that our body, it's, the, the beauty is real and it's reliable. Stamped into your body as a man, as a woman, is not only your identity, but your calling, your mission. Look at the body of a woman. Just for example, it's not a stereotype. Oh, women are more sensitive. Oh, this is far from a stereotype. Look at the woman's sense of hearing. It is completely different than the inner workings of a man's ear. Yes, there's many common structural things in common, but you actually have to speak. 
eight decibels higher when you're speaking to a boy than you are to a girl for the boy to hear you at the same level. If you've taught kids, you know what I'm talking about. This isn't because he, and so you just have to speak louder. I mean, it doesn't mean, you know, it means he hears you. It doesn't necessarily mean that he's listening, but eight decibels higher helps. I've seen this in our marriage. You know, my wife will wake me up sometimes like, honey, the baby's about to wake up. And then like a minute later, later like the baby wakes up. And I'm like, how did you do that? Like, it's amazing. Like, you can hear him before he's crying, and I can't even hear him while he's crying. Like, this is like remarkable stuff. But women, they've also found, can actually hear and detect nuances and inflections in the human voice that are completely imperceptible to the male brain. I think there's entire conversations the male brain can't hear as well, but that's a different subject altogether. Another thing, don't even try talking to a guy while he's reading. Why? Because they've done, they've done brain scans on men's brains while they're reading and they're actually functionally deaf while they're reading. And like, because we have a great ability as men to lock in on something and block out ambient noise, whereas the woman's brain is much better on absorbing those things. And it sounds like, oh, how come the girls are better than us and all this stuff? Well, actually there's one part of hearing that men do better than women, and that is locating the origin of a sound in three-dimensional space. I'm walking in the woods, I hear a branch crack 30 yards away, northeast, bam, that's where the sound came from. A man can pinpoint the origin of a sound, whereas a woman like, it's over there somewhere. Uh, and so, <laughs> But there's, there's complementarity behind these things. Just the, the sensitivity, the sensitivity of smell. Do you know that a woman's brain has more than seven million more olfactory cells in the part of the brain that detects smells and scents? And so like if your girlfriend comes to your dorm and she's like, it smells disgusting in here. And you're like, oh, it smells good to me. I don't know what you're talking about. It's like, dude, it stinks, okay? Do your laundry before Thanksgiving break. Don't wait to bring it home to mom. You can't just spray it with cologne, okay? Like, that doesn't make the clothes smell better. It makes the cologne smell, the, the clothing smell worse with the deodorant. Like, this is not the answer, okay? And so they smell differently than we smell. Um, emotions, the sensitivity to emotions. This study was great. A doctor took a bunch of kids, boys and girls, and put them in a room. Had a wall, and on the other side of the wall was a baby who was crying. And in the middle of the wall was an intercom, and you could hear the baby crying in the other room. And so there was a little switch where you could click the button, and you could talk to the baby if you wanted to, or you could just click the button and turn the volume off. Well, you can see where this is going. Uh, and so, invariably, the girls walked right over. Oh, hey, little baby, how you doing in there? You know, talk to the baby. The boys walked over, click, problem solved. You know, you know. <laughs> And so these differences point us to the fact that biologically, the way that biologists look at sex is it's how an organism is organized for reproduction. We are a sexually dimorphic species. There are only two gametes, mature reproductive cells, the sperm and the, the egg. Uh, there is no third, there is no spectrum to sex when you actually get down to the biology of it. But it, the way that the church looks at it is it's not just biological in the form of, of reproduction but the way that our bodies are organized for our vocational calling as mothers and fathers, whether it's biological or spiritual. And this is why I think the devil is so desperate to get women convinced that you need to be masculinized in order to be powerful. But I remember reading one quote, it said that women were not created to do everything a man can do. Women were created to do everything a man can't do. I read one man who said, look, whatever you give a woman, she will make greater. If you give her a sperm, she'll give you a baby. Uh, he, said, he said, if you give her a house, she'll give you a home. If you give her groceries, she'll give you a meal. If you give her a smile, she'll give you her heart. She multiplies and enlarges what is given to her. Now by this, I'm not saying biology is destiny. Therefore, barefoot, pregnant in the kitchen. No, I'm not going there. Where I'm going at is this. I met a nun recently. I had lunch with her. She's a nun. She's a doctor. She's a surgeon and she's a colonel in the United States Army. And I'm like, I'm like, did you not want to save any vocations for the rest of us, sister? You're like, hog them all yourself? Like, just not want to be an astronaut because you're lazy too? Like, I, uh, <laughs> sister, she was not doing these things instead of motherhood. She was mothering through these things. 
because she knew that womanhood, femininity, is not a mold or a cage that you have to fit into. It's a firm foundation upon which you can stand to bring to bear the weight of your feminine genius and to transform civilizations themselves. And so our differences as men and women do not reveal competition, it reveals complementarity. It reveals something of God. And we've been given by God a task to rediscover the meaning of our bodies, living that out as male and female. And as I mentioned, 30 minutes is hardly enough to cover this topic. It, it didn't even scratch the surface. And so over the past couple of years, I've been working on a book, uh, Answer These Things, because I've been spending so much time with young people and families wrestling with this. And so I figured, okay, I'm gonna read 15 books. I'll have a good handle, I'll write the book. After 15 books, I'm like, I don't even begin. I need five more books on that. I need 10 more books on this. 20 something pa pa thousand pages later of research and reading, um, finally finished the book. Shared it with different endocrinologists, psychologists, doctors of pediatric medicine, individuals who experience gender dysphoria. And the whole goal was to get it out in time for seek. And so we released it and rushed it from the printer and it just came out at our booth. Uh, and so it's called Male, Female, Other, A Catholic Guide to Understanding Gender. This will help you if you're wrestling with it. If you have a roommate who wants you to use a preferred pronoun, what am I supposed to do there? This will give you the data you need to go toe to toe with a gender studies professor, to be able to say, actually, that's not what the science shows. To be able to lovingly and charitably, with clarity and charity, explain the church's teachings on all these difficult, sensitive subjects. And so we've got a copy, we've got copies over at our booth. We'll be over near the Seek store. There's a couple other resources we've got in terms of living out your femininity. Uh, my wife and I wrote a book for the young women called How to Find Your Soulmate Without Losing Your Soul. Uh, so yeah, give it up. And, and uh, it's like a manual on how to avoid losers. So that's what that book is about. Um, and, and some people are like, where's the book for guys? You know, and I'm like, guys don't read, okay? Uh, and then, but the guys are bugging me like, no, like we're literate, we want book. Uh, and so I'm like, all right, dude. So we came out with the dating blueprint for the guys to kind of teach the guys how to date. Um, so, so this is, Instead of telling all the guys everything you're not supposed to do, girl, don't do this with a girl, don't do that, don't do that, don't. That's like all you hear in high school. Then you get to college, you're like, okay, I can't sleep with my girlfriend, can't look at porn with my girlfriend, I can't have an abortion with my girlfriend, uh, I can't clone my girlfriend. I learned that in theology class. Like, like, okay, like I know everything I can't do with a girl. Like, what am I supposed to do with one? Well, this goes through the principles of Catholic courtship and things like that. And so that's for the guys. And then lastly, we had a, my favorite book ever was my hero, St. John Paul the Great, his five loves. And so this will help you to fall in love with him if you haven't discovered him yet. And so these resources, the John Paul the Great book is in the Focus store. Um, I'll be there for the next hour and a half. And then also, I wanna throw up on the slide here. Uh, we wanna go out to dinner with some of you guys tonight and we wanna pay the dinner and pay the Uber. And so we d decided we'd do a fun thing tonight where we're gonna take, we're gonna do a drawing and we're gonna pick names out of there so that you and a friend, whoever you pick, uh, we're gonna just take you out to dinner. Uh, so we're gonna do an Uber, we'll do the drawing and it'll be before the concert so we can finish up and get back in time for the concert. And then we'll email you or text you or whatever, to let you know who wins. Uh, so they'll leave this up in case you want to scan it on the way out. There's also free digital guides you can get uh, for the girls. We have one called 10 Guys You're Better Off About. Uh, guys want how to ask her out and then a little booklet thing on uh, John Paul the Great. And so those are ways that you keep in touch with us. But the resources are there. But the goal of like creating all this stuff, especially with this new gender book, is try to tell these people in love, you were not created in the wrong body, okay? You were not born into the wrong body. You were kind of born, I think, into the wrong culture, a culture that told you that you have to hurt your body in order to be your authentic self. We need to affirm your body does not need to be reconstructed. Our culture needs to be reconstructed. And so you are needed in the plan of God to do that. So God bless you. Thank you so much. And I'll see you guys in the morning. Thank you very much. Everybody.